Hi everyone, I'm Tasha Sims here with Chris Mark Hobbs. Hobbs. Mark Curran, and I'm about to introduce you, Chris. Um, you're listening to Conscious Living Radio, 100.7 FM in Vancouver, Wednesday night, 6 p.m. I know if you're on Facebook right now, you're catching this live. Welcome. I'm excited about today's show. We are speaking with internationally renowned herbalist, acupuncturist, mycologist, clinician, and research scientist, Christopher Hobbs, PhD. Christopher has had over 35 years of experience with herbal medicine. He's a founding member of the American Herbalist Guild and has a doctorate from UC Berkeley in phylogenetics, genetics, evolutionary biology, and phytochemistry. So we're going to be discussing a seven week live video training that he's got coming up where you will learn everything that you need to know about psilocybin mushrooms, their benefits, how to use them, how to enhance cognition and memory, and as well as microdosing protocols, um, the way the medicine can open you up, open up mind and heart to spirit. So that course is starting soon, Monday, July 25th. We'll dive right in and just a bit. Welcome to the show, Christopher. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tasha. Glad so, to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Um, is, I mean, psychedelics, psychedelic plants, fungi have been used in indigenous cultures for millennia. I wonder if you can give us just a brief history of how modern psych, uh, psychedelic research began and the whole introduction to it. Yes, well, it depends on how far back you want to go. Uh, you, you know, there had um, Parents McKenna was the one I guess that came up with the idea of the stoned ape theory. So, so his, his idea was that even primates before modern humans arose may maybe uh, were eating psychedelic mushrooms, and that's one of these uh, the stimulus uh, of you know creating our big brain and revolutionizing our use of tools and language and you know our the, the big steps that we made say about a million years ago it's thought that modern humans arose about a million years ago when they did when we discovered fire so you could go all the way back there of course there's no proof one way or the other uh, to that theory but uh, going forward we know that that uh, most likely in uh, in the rig vedas which are holy scriptures from uh, vedic scriptures uh, from india uh, the the uh, you know religion or or spiritual practices there. Uh, they had many songs and, and many writings about uh, an agent called Soma, S-O-M-A. And, and researchers don't really know what Soma wa it was. Uh, they, they don't really describe it accurately. Uh, so it's thought maybe it was Amanita muscaria that has been put forward, uh, and, or even Ephedra sinensis that contains the alkaloid ephedrine because of its stimulating action. But more than likely, uh, the way they talk about it, like I must, I, I'm kissing the sky, I must have been drinking Soma, things like that. So it really gives you the sense that they were get, having some type of visionary experience. And it, it turns out that uh, Psilocybe cubensis does grow in cow fields in India. So it is very possible that, that the ancients were using psilocybin uh, and this is this is a long time ago. This is like uh, you know three thousand years ago. So it could be that that that's uh, an example of early, very early use of psilocybin mushrooms uh, and how it affected human culture. Uh, and then going forward, we know that uh, psilocybin grows abundantly in South America. That certainly is a perfect tropical climate for that, and then southern Mexico as well. And when, when the um, Spaniards came over to South America and first, and it, they were really invaders when they came over and they invaded South America and, and came in contact with the Incans and the Mayans, uh, they discovered that they were already, there was an amazing mushroom, mushroom culture there. They had carved mushroom stones and they found hundreds of these beautiful mushroom stones uh, and, and that they were eating them and using them uh, mainly for divinatory purposes, they for so the priests use them, and also healers use them. But the average person also apparently used them 
um, for personal growth, maybe, mm -hmm. or just uh, for enjoyment, sheer enjoyment. But, but this was written about in the 1500s. So we do have the first written records of psilocybin and human use in the 1500s. Then we go on <clears throat> and jump forward to the 1950s when Gordon Wasson and, and uh, Valentina Wasson came down to, well, I guess the first trip was only Gordon Wasson came down. He was a, the world's most famous amateur mycologist. And well, along with his wife, Valentina, who was Russian and a mushroom lover, wrote a lot about the cultural uses of mushrooms. And, and he had heard that, that uh, mushrooms are being used for divinatory purposes and for sacred purposes in southern Mexico. So he traveled down there with a photographer and uh, he asked around and did some research and finally, this, um, finally met uh, Maria Sabina. And Maria Sabina is a, was a Christian mystic who used psilocybin of Lada's and, and psilocybin for healing. So uh, she would have patients that, that were, would come in and they would have some malady or illness or, or problem. And then she would eat the mushrooms and they might eat them too. And then she would be shown uh, you know, certain things. She would, she would gain some wisdom about, about the condition of the patient and maybe on a more spiritual dimension. So this was very famous because this is, this is really the beginning um, entree uh, for psilocybin and the use of hallucinogens to um, a modern pop society, well, North America, and uh, because it was published in Life magazine in 19, right. I think it was 56. So is so, Albert Hoffman involved at that point as well? That's kind of where, because he Albert synthesized. Hoffman, Albert Hoffman was, of course, the discoverer of LSD yeah. and took the world's most famous bike ride. But Albert Hoffman, so um, <clears throat> uh, they, they contacted uh, Albert Hoffman because they, they wanted and sent him some samples of Maria Sabina's mushrooms. Right. And they were wondering if he could isolate the active compound. So he isolated psilocybin, or psilocybin and psilocin, and then he made pills of the purified alkaloids. And then on the second trip, Half Hoffman came over to Mexico and met them. And then they all together went to and met Maria Sabina and went through another uh, sacred journey. Only they used the tablets the second time. And, and the story goes that, that uh, they didn't, they, they used the amount of alkaloids in the tablets that would be in the amount of mushrooms that Maria Sabina usually used. And so they ate the tablets and they gave Maria Sabina a tablet and they, after a while, say half hour, 45 minutes, they asked her, is do you feel anything? And she said, no, I don't, I feel nothing. And so they took two more. And, and then all of a sudden what they didn't realize is that the purified alkaloid is absorbed much more slowly than in the mushroom. So then they all started to, to have this incredible experience and they you know just blew the top of their head off apparently. So in fact, there's a picture in Life magazine of him lying on the floor with his his eyes are about as big as saucers, you know, and and just really having an amazing experience. So, so that's the way that story goes, and and you know, there's quite a bit on that, but uh, uh, I find it fascinating. It is it, it's it's an incredible story, and there was such um, interest right in this area, and how did it? all shut down? How did it go from there to becoming an illegal substance? There was curiosity start with, I mean, Life Magazine is fairly mainstream that they're right. publishing this. This is not, you know, an alternative magazine. How did it go from that to um, this kind of shutdown? And, and now, of course, to the renaissance that's occurring, if we can just kind of bridge all that. Yes. Well, next, what happened is, of course, as soon as the, the article came out and the hippies were happening anyway, starting to happen. I mean, the, the you know, the, the Grateful Dead band started up in in what, uh, 58, 59. Uh, yeah, 58, 59. And then uh, uh, and uh, no, no, no. Sorry. About 65. So so this is this is a this is slowly percolated, I think, and wasn't widely available. But then a lot of people started coming down to Maria Sabina, and there was a lot of issues with that. Uh, later, a lot of repercussions for her and the village. But at, over those five or six or seven years, 
that that then um, the hippies show you know came the summer of love and all that that's like 68 67 and so forth then it really got out in the mainstream and became just totally wide open and then lsd was happening at the same time timothy leary uh came came on the scene and was just saying tune in uh you know drop and drop out uh, turn on tune in and drop out and uh th th that was obviously going to be very threatening to the government so uh you know with all the uses and all the all the hoopla about it and all and so many people using it it just started blowing up and so it and then there were a lot of clinical trials. Believe it or not, there in the 1950s, there were actually hundreds of studies on LSD and psilocybin for, for, um, for depression, for a lot for, for um, addiction, alcohol addiction especially. And so there were all these small clinical trials. They weren't very big. Uh, some of them were not published, but there literally was so much research going on. Timothy Leary himself was doing research in in students which got mm -hmm. him into trouble but so all this research happened huge body which has been summarized in the literature so you can go and read a paper that that kind of describes all in more detail all of these studies that were done but they were smaller they were not uh, you know so so much controlled trials so then uh, about 19 i guess it was 1977 right around there it was all shut down so psilocybin, all these other hallucinogens were all made schedule one drugs. And, and then all the, of the research licenses were pulled. So no more research until we jump forward to 2006, when the mm -hmm. first, uh, w when the first clinical trial was, was allowed um, through direct petition to the FDA. Uh, and, and then slowly but surely there were two or three other studies uh, in, in the two, in late 2000s, uh, and then the licenses were restored after that. And now, now there are literally, I think, around 25 or 30 clinical trials in progress right now. If, if the listener wants to look into those, you can just go on to clinicaltrials.gov on the web, and they will describe all of the clinical trials that are in progress. But already there are t 25 or even more clinical trials um, that, that have shown benefits, uh, you know, uh, more effective than any m current medicine that we have now for intractable depression, anxiety, uh, addiction, of course, PTSD, uh, and, and the existential fear uh, of, of receiving a, a cancer diagnosis, a terminal diagnosis, mm -hmm. life-threatening diagnosis. So all of these uh, research studies are ongoing and now the first very large clinical trial is happening. A company who produces a standardized product of psilocybin has, has started a multiphasic clinical trial. I think it's uh, in about two years now. So there are, it's, we haven't gotten results of that, but those results are really going to be a game changer when those are published and probably in the next year or two. And so are these kinds of studies dependent on self-reporting or how are they measured, the majority of them? How are they actually measuring the benefits and the results and the therapeutic uh, value? Do you know? Well, uh, going into addiction, it's easier. So if uh, yeah. some studies have been done on smoking cessation. So if, if they give a person, you know, psilocybin, it's, it's standardized. It's always a standardized product where they've measured the exact amount of alkaloids that people are getting. And they, there might be a placebo control uh, that they can use of niacin, where you feel tingling all over your body if you take a dose of niacin. And so this isn't a very perfect placebo, but sometimes they're placebo controlled in, in that way, or they give a very low dose of psilocybin and then a much higher dose of psilocybin. So they try to control it, but with, with um, say tobacco addiction, uh, it's been easier because they can follow up. They can see if the person is abstinent. Uh, so if the person is abstinent after one year or two years, this is better in, in a, a large proportion. I think the percentage is about 70% of the people that have a spiritual experience when they take the psilocybin in the clinical trial, they are abstinent, abstinent for 
literally a year or two years, 70% abstinence, and that's better than any other treatment known. And, mm -hmm. and with, of course, with, with very few, if any, side effects. Uh, but, but there's one caveat here for all of these clinical trials, and that is the people that take the higher doses and have a very profound spiritual experience. Some people describe that this is the most uh, profound spiritual uh, experience that they've ever had in their entire lives, then it's more effective. The treatment is more effective and people get better results. Well, it, it totally makes sense with addiction. It kind of backs up Gabor, Dr. Gabor Mate's, you know, the hungry ghost, the whole, um, that addiction is actually feeding that loss of spiritual connection. Right. So you have That's an right. experience where you go, okay, like, this is it. This is, this, I, I remember this. It's actually more the feeling than this is yeah. something new. Um, but with, let, let's do depression. Let's talk a little bit about microdosing because it's become, I think people are feeling so hopeful where they're going, wow, I could microdose something without side effects. And that would help me with my depression because so many people um, who are prescribed medication for depression also experience tons of side effects. And it's really a, it's a, it's a hard, hard road, right? To even assess sometimes. So is microdosing, because we've talked about doing a larger dose and having an experience and then bringing in microdosing in terms of the studies for, let's say, depression. Do you know, um, is there anything specific that you can share with us? Yes. Well, um, first of all, I have to frame that question with um, the, um, the point of view that, that it isn't really the, the, the psilocybin or LSD, but in this case, we're talking about psilocybin. The psilocybin is not a cure-all. It's not a magic bullet, it's not a magic pill. However, what it does is well, you have to work with it. And that's why it's so important, especially if you're dealing with something, a, a more major a psychological uh, imbalance that you work with a facilitator, a trained facilitator, because it's the, the follow-up, the integration, what we call integration after the, the uh, journey is so vital to what kind of results you're going to get. So you, it isn't that you would be microdosing every day and then, you know, that is going to eventually ease up your depression or anxiety. It could, we just don't have any clinical trials directly that can support that idea. But what it can do, I mean, I'm a practitioner myself and I have patients who I recommend psilocybin to. And what I've seen is that things start to open up. They start, you know, some of these things that, for instance, I, I, a patient who has really intractable anxiety. So by using psilocybin microdosing, it starts to, you know, she really felt like something, some things were opening up, loosening up so that she could get in touch with them. And, she, you know, it's just so much more powerful to not uh, just be uh, unconscious about what is holding us back or what, it, what the underlying causes of these, say, really emotional um, uh, feelings that we're having, really strong emotional feelings and, and mood, mood variations like, like obviously depression or anxiety. So it's more powerful if we can, and, and so um, beneficial if we can go in and we can start, and that starts to open up. Well, these are early events or Lack, you know, I'm a big fan of Gabor Mate myself. I've read all of his books, watched all of his videos. He's amazing. So, you know, what he talks about is lack of attunement uh, as, as we're young, but these things start to open up and we can then maybe feel them. And we can, uh, in meditation, I really recommend meditation as an as a, um, adjunct to psilocybin use and counseling, all of these things can mm -hmm. be useful. But in meditation, we can actually become, uh, we can get in touch with these early feelings and early events that have happened in our life that, that are really underlying these, these problems that, that come up for us. So you're uh, talking about a very holistic approach. We can't just narrow it in and go, okay, do the mushrooms, it'll help. It's, it's everything, it's integrating it all. Right. It is, but psilocybin yeah. is so amazing because people who are who are very narrowed down, say they they were raised in a family 
that had a very, very narrow point of view, perhaps a, um, I'm not picking on Christians, but perhaps raised in a Christian family that where dancing was, and I've had patients like this, where dancing was not allowed, laughter even. I mean, it's a very, very narrow um, way of being brought up. And, and this can, op you know, can loosen this up and open this up, open our mind up to other possibilities and ways of being. So it's so valuable, but it is not a standalone, in my, my experience, it's not a standalone uh, medicine, a magic bullet by any means. Mm -hmm. I, I, can, I can tell you that I, at one point when I was young, um, many years ago, I, I microdosed for nine months straight every day. And so I've had a lot of experience with microdosing uh, over the years and macrodosing as well. But certainly microdosing made, made a big difference in my life. It really, really did. It, but because it opened me up to some of the things that I was holding from my early childhood that I really came to me and I really realized. And at the end of the day, that, that it's only the love that really matters. And my mm -hmm. parents did the best they could. They were they had parents maybe that were um, passing on, uh, you know, some emotional or psychological dysfunction to the, with them and and lack of attunement, lack of attention that they and love that they needed, direct love and attention. And and so at the end of the day, I just uh, psilocybin helped me come to the place where I realized that that really the, the love is all that matters. And and these other mm -hmm. things we can we can let those go. It's a, we're able to let those go and mm -hmm. release those with the use of meditation, counseling, uh, a facilitator, and this beautiful mushroom, uh, psilocybin. And your what was your protocol when you say you did it nine months? You don't mean without day. Did you have a protocol like five on? I kind of, I kind of. I, in those days, there was no, not really, not much written about it or knowledge about it. So, so I, I just followed my heart on. Uh, and how I was feeling. I mean, there were some weeks where I microdosed every day, maybe one gram, uh, maybe, a, you know, a little bit more than one gram, but it's kind of, you know, you can talk about the dose, what's a microdose and what's a macrodose, but typically a microdose is, you know, anywhere from 100 milligrams of dried mushroom, depending on the strength of the mushroom, up to one gram. So that whole range in there could be termed a microdose. Tip for me, typically, a proper microdose is around, for, especially if you're beginning, is around 100 to 200, or even up to 300 for some people. So that range is a very, uh, very gentle microdose, but it still has effects. Uh, so I usually, I typically recommend that people take a day off, and they so the, the microdosing is like one day on, one day off, and and you adjust the dose based on if you're taking too much, it can be very distracting. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you might be having, you might be laughing at mundane things. You might feel kind of a, a little bit uh, dizzy and, and spacey and so forth. So you can get these, these you can get effects that, that won't allow you to go through your work day or, or your day without getting really distracted. You start listening to the music and suddenly you're, you're off into Miles Davis or something and you just can't break away from Miles Davis. It's so incredible. So, um, so you've got to adjust that dose so that it's not as distracting, but it's enough so that you really do feel uh, an effect, uh, which mm -hmm. to me is between one and 300 milligrams typically. So you're saying it's individual? It's individual. Because I've heard people say, if you're microdosing, you won't feel anything in the moment. <laughs> it doesn't mean it doesn't have an ac accumulative ben benefit, but you're saying you would. You'd actually feel something just not so much that it takes you away from what you need to do and stay focused and functioning. Is it well, my understanding? Yeah, um, typically, I mean, for me, I don't, if you don't feel anything, it's not going to have much effect. If you feel absolutely nothing, it's not going to have much effect. Um, maybe if you're taking it long term day after day or every other day for months, then, uh, you know, there's some new research on psilocybin showing that that it could work on our neurons. It can work yeah. on our neurocircuitry. It could untangle when things are kind of tangled up in there and there's cross-linking and so forth. It can help open that up, straighten it out. It can help um, make the connections between the neurons stronger, uh, more durable, and it, it can build new connections. So uh, there's a lot of research on that right now, very exciting. So we just don't have the research to show that if you're taking a dose like say 50 milligrams 
uh, of the mushroom and you're mm -hmm. not feeling anything mm -hmm. and you're taking it day after day, we have no idea what it's going to be doing in there. Maybe it does have an effect. For me, um, if you take 150 milligrams, probably you're gonna, your mood is going to pick up. Your mood is, is going to elevate and you're going to feel happier. You're going to feel more open. You're going to feel, you're going to connect with nature around you more. Uh, you're going to find that, that you're enjoying uh, the present moment. It's easier to come into the present moment and enjoy the present moment more. There, a new study came out recently that showed that, uh, and, and it was an app that was handed out to thousands of people and they put it on their phone. And the, the researchers actually had uh, in, within the app, it had a notice send out to all these thousands of people. What are you doing right now? Are you, are you, you know, are you thinking about something else or are you focused on what you're actually doing? And it turned out after they gathered all this data, they found that most people are only paying attention to the present moment about 50% of the time. So we're, we're off thinking about something else than the present moment about 50% mm -hmm. of the time. And, may, and I think that's an understatement personally, but, but uh, psilocybin can help bring you uh, into, into where present. you're enjoying the present moment so much that you're not running, your mind isn't running off thinking about the laundry or thinking about, oh, well, why did they say that to me or whatever it is. And, and um, so I think you should be feeling something, especially a, a pickup in mood and more connectivity to the present moment and to nature. That's what I mm -hmm. found over, and again, I've had years and years of experience with that. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting what you're saying, because I, I have, uh, I've been uh, being told, I had been told that you don't feel anything. And so I thought, oh, okay, when I read this thing about neurons, I went, well, something is happening. I'm gonna wait and see. Because, and especially if you're in a field where I can't, I need to function, I need to be present. As a therapist, I need to be present. There's no way I can, right. there's no other option. So to me, the idea of doing too much would only make sense if it's a free day, but I wouldn't, right. I can't jeopardize the experience with a client to muck around and go, let's see how this goes. Like I can't do that. So, but it's interesting and I'm gonna take what you're saying and on a free day, maybe see what happens if I increase it a little, because I'm doing the 50, because that's how it's marketed, actually, as a well, microdose. Yeah, but um, again, there's no there's no um, really support for 50 milligrams yeah. doing anything, yeah. Li li yeah. literally anything. Whereas if you're taking 100 or 120, then you can, I mean, totally, you can, uh, you know, it's not that distracting. You can, you're, you can do whatever you, you can, you can do, you can get into your counseling, you can get into whatever you're doing perfectly fine. And it's not going to distract you from that. Right. And, and I think that's a more effective dose. There, there's a new research study out on flow <clears throat> and flow is when we're, you know, in the Tao, basically it's a new, newer term for being in the Tao. So if you're in the flow, that means that, you know, you're say you're a musician, and, and you're just playing and you're not thinking, your mind is completely empty. And as a teacher, I'm, you know, that's what I, my parents were teachers and, and I consider myself a teacher, you know, almost first and foremost, I love teaching, but if, but if you're really in the zone and really in the flow, then all kinds of really incredible and creative things can come out. As long as you're not sitting there thinking about well, what am I going to say next or, you know, what I have to do, I have to talk about that or that. No, you're in a flow. And, you know, obviously uh, basketball players get into the flow. Uh, that's how writers, artists, win. writers yeah. definitely get into the flow, yeah. musicians. So uh, I think I, could, I think psilocybin helps you get into the flow. I really do. And can we talk just a little bit more about these neurons because, um, and perception. So what I see a lot with trauma and the, the, I love metaphors. So I'll see like the, the groove of a record. And to me, if you have a particular perception that has been developed as perhaps a protection from whatever trauma you experience, it is like a groove in the record. It's, it's deep. It's going around. That's just how you see things. And so creating new pathways sometimes feels like instead of that easy groove in the record, like you're in the jungle and it's virgin, virgin jungle, and you've got to slosh your way through, like initially when you first discover it. So 
in terms of untangling, I'm sure that's because things are tangled. Like I, when I saw that word, it really resonated for me. And I went, yeah, meditation, breath, um, psilocybin, all these things are softening the attachment, which then leads to it kind of untangling. That's the sense I got reading it. But I wonder if in some of the studies, if you can share anything that's actually happening with which part of the brain and, and just scientifically looking at what, what's going on there and how, and does it um, shift perception? Is that part of the healing of, of trauma from your understanding? It definitely does shift per perception. I'm not sure it's so much untangling neurons. That's going to be a longer term process. Um, however, uh, I think what it really does is there, there are certain areas of the brain that have that are associated with certain functions. And so our sense of self, our ego, we associate that with the default mode network. So there isn't, there are two areas of the brain that are, that are called the default mode network. And so when we use a hallucinogen, including psilocybin, this kind of deactivates the default mode network so that we lose our sense of self. We, and you know, if you, you're a fan of Gabor Mate, Gabor Mate says that, that the ego really is an artificial construct that that's developed over, over our life to protect us and to kind of narrow our focus down so that we're not bombarded with all this input that's out there, but also that it, it is a, it's a protective layer on us um, so that we don't have to feel constant, you know, fear or, or uh, anger and so forth. And, and all the things, the slings and arrows, emotional mm -hmm. slings and arrows that come to us, uh, our ego is, is going to help us cope with those. But at the same time, our ego is very narrow based on what, what the possible real possibilities out there are, uh, our, our vision, our, our, create, our creative impulse, all of that is gonna be also shut down. Our ability to love, our ability to, to, uh, ha to practice uh, loving kindness, all of these are going to be limited by this artificial construct that we call the ego and other constructs. Uh, and so that's what psilocybin and other hallucinogens do is that they, they really subdue and they really kind of shut down the default mode network. So all of this is opened up and suddenly we're not, we're not really inhibited and bounded uh, and constricted by, uh, by these, you know, by, by the, this is exactly what you're talking about, the grooves. We're, we're, not, we're not constricted by those grooves. Then. Mm -hmm. You've used the word narrow quite a bit. And I remember listening to a clip um, before this interview where you were talking about how narrowing our thought process, you were talking about conspiracy theories and how they contribute right. to narrowing the thought process to see things from one aspect. Um, I wonder if you could touch on that and, and how, because it's, it's so prevalent in today's world, there is, is. so much it, it, narrowing occurring, us and them. That's a very narrow, if that's it, us and them, there, where do you go? There's nowhere to go. Like literally, there's nowhere to go. Good guys, bad guys, nowhere to go. Yeah. Right? It's sad. So it's really if, you, sad. if you could comment on that, I would appreciate it. Well, to comment on that, I, I, I have to go back to the, um, the Delphi. And the Delphi were a, a group of, of, of seers and mystics that lived north of Athens, up in the mountains. And uh, their temple is still there. I think it's the temple of the Apollo that was there. And it turns out that the, the seer, the, the, the oracle, the oracle of, of Delphi is very, very famous in the ancient world. Rulers would come and ask questions uh, and, and many, many people would come and make a pilgrimage to ask a question of the oracle. And it turns out that we think that she was sitting on a platform over a crevasse where psychedelic vapors were coming out of the ground. And, and, uh, but it could be that, she, that they were in, imbibing some substance, maybe psychedelic mushrooms, we don't know. But this is what they think now based on, on archaeology and so forth. But, but uh, the Delphi, the, the, the temple was ruined over, over a thousand 
2,000 years, 2,500 years, but one stone was still intact. And on that stone, there were three aphorisms. There were three sayings, the way to, to lead your life that are very important. And the first one is know thyself. That's a very famous one. In other words, go in, go inward. Uh, and the second one is everything in nothing in excess, nothing in excess, everything in moderation. That's the second one. But the third one is I consider the most important, which is basically uh, what we're talking about, constriction and, and narrow, narrow thinking, uh, narrow mindedness is, is ruin. And so that was the third one. And they, I think they realized that, that and, and this is what we are seeing in our society right now. We're seeing because of all the emotional trauma that's been handed down generation to generation, this is coming out of Gabor Mate, that this is what we're seeing now. We're seeing people going to conspiracy theor theories and obviously polarizing to people that are unlike us are, are bad. We can't communicate with them. We, we, we even get angry. We even an get angry and push them away because they think differently than we do. Uh, and it's, it's really sad, but, but we, even the ancients knew that, that, that this is a very important thing, that open-mindedness is so wonderful. It's so refreshing, but also it allows us to evolve. It allows us to, to grow as, as a species, as, a, as an individual, it allows us to grow. And, and uh, so narrow-mindedness is ruin. And, and open to new possibilities. And which that's is what psilocybin growth. does. It, o yeah. it opens that narrow mindedness up. And w I've seen it with my own eyes, people that, that were so narrow, so narrowed down in their life that they were miserable, absolutely miserable. There's no joy in their life. And through the use of, um, you know, many uh, facilitators use MDMA. So they might start with MDMA in, in the whole program. And the uh, working in working with someone to open the heart and then the, the larger psilocybin doses are used to shut down the default mode network and so those are often used together actually and you had talked also about using a facilitator having a guide having a mentor how do you pick is there criteria to consider when you're picking a facilitator or is it as simple as oh this person feels good or are there some specific things that that a person would look for to consider to choose. Well, that's a good question, and 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 so on one hand, I'm not saying that you can't take so it shouldn't take psilocybin by yourself. If you are taking like over a gram or say two grams or three grams, it's really good to have a loved one that you feel really comfortable with to hold the space for you. But if you if you can't find a facil trained facilitator because most facilitators these days are still underground. So there are networks of facilitators that you can find. Uh, they're starting to offer ketamine uh, online. So you can actually have the ketamine sent and you can have a live facilitator on Zoom or whatever. But obviously that isn't, that isn't nearly as good as having a live facilitator working with you. So uh, it's, first of all, it's kind of hard to find a good facilitator. Secondly, if you can find a good facilitator, it's very important to have a phone conversation or two, or even go and meet them in person to see whether it feels right. So you can ask questions about their training, uh, about how, they, how they're going to approach the, the whole um, journey, your, your journey, uh, and, and just, just the, feeling that you connect, the feeling of connection that you might feel with them. So all of those things are important. I believe when choosing a facilitator, but certainly your gut feeling is most important. The gut, your gut feeling mm -hmm. and how you're feeling about the person, but then, okay, what kind of training have they had? How much experience has they, have, have they had as a facilitator? How many years? What kind of, um, what were their, who were their mentors and teachers? Because there are certain lineages uh, that we have in this country. Uh, so all of these things are, are very important to look into and, uh, you know, in Oregon, they've already published the draft guidelines of what a, a facilitator needs if they go to a training program, a, an actual training program, and become licensed in psychedelic assisted uh, psychotherapy, for instance. Then you wow. have to have certain training. You might have to have a two-year program. You might have to have a bachelor's degree 
or whatever. So this is this is still in the works. Right. Um, I even even though there will be training programs that may be licensed, it's still going to be important to have under underground uh, facilitators available because obviously if a person has a lot of formal training, there it's going to be pretty expensive. It's going to be much more expensive, and um, whereas I know that there are some personally, I know some facilitators that are amazing facilitators that have you know they haven't had that kind of formal training but they do have some counseling experience and they just really care about people right. and and so we we need all of this and i think all of it will be there well let's i, I want to make sure we dive into your course and and really tell the listeners right now um, more about it so it's starting soon, right? The 25th of mon uh, Monday, and it's going to run for seven weeks every Monday at 11. Is that right? For an hour right. and a half? Right. Hour and online. a half every, every week. Yeah. Online for seven weeks. There are some, um, some really good um, bonuses. Uh, I, I'm, I've done an interview. I'm going to talk about um, the, the importance of music uh, in, in a separate a bonus a video. I'm going to talk about and audio. I'm going to talk about the importance of music, of choosing the music during a session. Uh, I'm giving away some of my books. Uh, and so there are bonuses to, to join the class. And I, I hope you do. It's going to be a fantastic class. You're right, seven weeks. Uh, and I'm going to go into really all aspects of, of psilocybin therapy from the, the historical parts. I'm going to talk about the hero's journey, which is a fascinating way of looking at the psilocybin journey, the hero's journey, which we all can go through, or the heroine's journey. The hero or heroine's journey is, is really universal. It's a universal archetype. So we're going to talk about that and how it applies to our personal journey. Uh, and I'm going to go into all, all aspects. Again, I'm going to talk about um, accessing psilocybin, whether it be uh, growing maybe growing on your own or finding a grower, uh, whether whether it's finding um, an outlet that, that's selling or, or you know, maybe a, a, a network of growers, uh, and also picking in the wild. I'm going to talk about the psilocybin species that grow in the wild and, of course, the cautions that should you should always keep in mind when you're picking wild mushrooms. I'm a wild mushroom, hunt, you know, forayer from way back. I just was up in the mountains yesterday um, and the morels are still popping up. So I, I, it's so joyful to pick wild mushrooms and use them for food. They're so delicious. And also there are wild psilocybin mushrooms growing out there that are very, very potent, like the Liberty Cap or, or Psilocybe cyanescens. Those are incredibly potent, even more potent than the ones that you can buy. But again, you have to know where to look for them, what kind of habitat, and also there are some cautions. So I'm going to go into that. I'm going to go into growing, different aspects of growing. That's that's also really important. Uh, it, it's pretty, it, it can be tricky to grow. However, I, I work closely with with uh, with a grower uh, who, who has got a lot of experience, decades of experience. And he tells me that psilocybin is one of the easiest mushrooms to grow, that it's very forgiving. And once you get it going, it is quite easy and quite, you know, produces a lot of, mm -hmm. of fruiting bodies. So I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to go, really go into, uh, a you know, finding a facilitator, all the details on choosing a, a great facilitator for you. Uh, there are many details on that. Uh, so there'll be Q&A. So it'll be personal if people, right? It, every it won't session just be... will, yes, every session will include a half hour of, of Q&A so that you can ask your questions. And even online, you can even we'll have a forum where, where we'll talk about it online. So there's going to be a lot of interaction. And that's one of the best that's parts right. of having a live class versus yeah. a pre-recorded class. Yeah. That there always will be Q&A. And I, what I found over the years is that, that we all have a lot of questions. So, so that's an important part. And then I'm going to have a whole class on microdosing. So I'm going to really go into detail how to use, how to use um, psilocybin as a microdose, the benefits, uh, what to look out for and how often and so forth. So, uh, and, and making, making your own products, making your own liquids. That's another thing that you can do at home. Well, and I also love that you're touching on to me, one of the most important aspects that people kind of don't seem to really uh, gravitate toward which is integration. Um, so 
is that part going to be experiential? Are you actually going to offer some ways to work with meditation or, or journaling or how will, how will integration be approached in the course? Oh, definitely. Yes. I'm going to talk about specific, I'm going to talk about many of the ways that, <clears throat> that we can use to integrate the, <clears throat> the insights and the visions that we've had and experiences that we've had into our daily life. So yes, I will probably have some exercise there. I start out the, the course with a meditation uh, which is going to act as kind of a model of later on when I talk about integration too, because I'm going to bring in some some of the, the things that we want to envision, uh, you know, when we're talking about and, and when after you know the the experience with psilocybin. Uh, so that that is going to be a very important part of the course. Is integration is so crucial, and and I will give some very practical insights, and and we'll probably practice some of them too online. So I know Mark's created a page on consciouslivingradio.org where people can um, sign up and get more information, but it, it, you've got Tuesday. So that, I guess, tomorrow, for those who are live right now, you're going to be doing an introduction again. That's also available, I think, right, Mark, on the website? Oh, can't hear him. No, we'll read that your lips. Correct, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's already there on the website page is there, consciousnewradio.org with all the information, links to Christopher's websites and the Ship Network program coming up and everything he's got going on is all there and ready. Great. Thank you so much. You made it easy. That's wonderful. Yeah. So I have one final question, unless there's something else you want to say about the course before I ask you my final question. Well, I think if you're interested in psilocybin and <clears throat> well, excuse me, one thing I want to say is that overall, and it, it's, it's something that I've, I've been really thinking strongly about, and that is, we know that we have a sick society. There, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. Uh, just open up the New York Times or any news media. And, and we have problems all over the world. And, and so, you know, things are not going well for the human race right now. And then there's the pandemic, of course, and war and, and other things. So things are not going that well right now. And I just know from experience and also from, you know, tuning into the literature and the media and so forth, I just presented a, a, a talk at the Integrative Psychiatric Institute in Boulder. And um, one of the speakers there was saying that it's thought right now that about 30% of the population may have some type of, of significant mood disorder or psychiatric disorder, probably not psychiatric disorder, but mood disorder, like anxiety or, or depression and so forth from, you know, not necessarily <clears throat> that's pathological that really is ruining their life, but it is such a big part of our experience right now, <clears throat> worldwide and in our country, especially with the younger people and teens, they're having a really hard time right now. So my point being, is that can we count on the politicians to fix these problems? I, you know, I'll ask the listeners, what do you think? <laughs> can we depend on the Supreme Court and the politicians for fixing all of these problems and to heal the wounds and the divisions? No, we can't. We obviously can't. So what is needed is a worldwide shift in consciousness. That is absolutely what we, what we can understand. And this is what's happening right now. There's so many positive signs right now going on. And, the, and I think psilocybin, I would argue that psilocybin is a really important part uh, of this shift and in, in a universal shift of consciousness. So we might be coming to like, if the stoned ape theory is correct, or if when our big brain was developed, you know, psilocybin was a part of that. And uh, then and maybe even in, in the Socrates day when rational thought was created, then maybe psilocybin was part of that. We don't know, but I, I have a feeling that this that psilocybin and other hallucinogens now are going to be part of this of, of this really huge universal shift of consciousness that that is going to be the next step for humans, and it's so needed right now. Well, and that was my final question: was literally how does this focus on self on the individual contribute to collective well-being? Yes. Um, and, and I think you'd said it way earlier when you realize that love is all there is ultimately, then everything you say, do or see 
perceive would be in alignment with that. There, it wouldn't be separate from that. No. Right? And, and if the mushrooms, if these medicines can bring us to a state of sameness and oneness and that sense of, of connection, you're right. I'd rather do that than, than wait for some politician to fix it. Or, no, know, that's, not gonna that's, happen. A, that's an iffy proposition. Yeah. And yeah. I, I just had no for personal experience that psilocybin can really help dissolve the separations and, and, and the chasm between people. And, and uh, I think that's one of its greatest gifts. Mm -hmm. And that politicians need to go on a journey themselves is what I think. <clears throat> well, that my friend true. and I always have this fantasy that we're going to lock all of these politicians up <laughs> in this, you know, this care facility or whatever therapy facility, big one, where they can have a garden and all that. And, and the only water they get is going to have psilocybin in it. <laughs> so they have to drink the water, you know, they're going to get some psilocybin. So they'll be microdosing and they'll be macrodosing. And, and this may really create a difference, but you know, that's just a fantasy. So appreciate having you on the show, sharing your knowledge and expertise. Um, again, everyone, please go on the website, check out the upcoming seven week course, everything you want to know about psilocybin and, and more. I say even for people who are versed and have used it recreationally, you're going to learn a ton um, and there'll be lots of gifts for you along the way. Thanks for joining us, Christopher. Thank you for having me. Tasha okay. and Mark. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Bye for now. <laughs>